Yo, what's up everybody? It is March 15th, the Ides of March, right? So, today it actually didn't end up that bad. I mean, NASDAQ ended up positive. Uh, we recovered more than half the loss. I mean, it went crazy in the morning selling the, the Dow down 600 points and the S&P was not much change at all. I like to go by the method of keep it simple, remember the, the KISS method, keep it simple stupid. Maybe just because, I don't know, maybe I'm stupid, whatever, I just like to keep it simple stupid. And I get it, I get it when, you know, like the media, they gotta talk about stuff and calamity and crises and all these kinds of things, especially when it relates to money and markets. This, this is big, these are big topics. This is big news all the time and it's pumped up and it's blown up and it's very emotional and it's very sensational and, and I don't blame people for, you know, getting caught up in that stuff. And I'm not saying that I necessarily have it right. I mean, maybe, maybe we're on the verge of some kind of uh, contagion banking crisis, but, but I have my doubts and I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. First of all, there was a response, there was a political response today from the White House for this uh, SVB bank. Uh, they're going to get a bailout or they're going to get some help. And you have to understand, too, that the financial industry has, like, enormous political sway in Washington. Now, you know, that might make you furious and it might make you pissed off. And it definitely, a lot of times, makes me pissed off. But, I mean, that's just... That's just the way it is. It's like the military industrial complex. I mean, enormous political sway and influence in Washington. And when things look shaky, you know, stuff is going to get done. But when I say keep it simple, stupid, like I just keep looking at, and this is something that I brought up with you guys. I keep looking at these fiscal flows, uh, which, by the way, we had two bad days. We had two days of, of net drain. I think we had something like a, a, a 13 billion and then uh, yesterday a 19 billion. So or, already 32 billion. That didn't help at all. And that, you know, that was the March 15th drain that I was talking about for, for small corporations. And uh, that's going to, you know, that's not done yet. It doesn't take two days. We know that these things, they typically take like four to six weeks. And we got the big April tax drain coming in in April. So the market's going to be under pressure because of these things. And these are the things I, I talked to you about. This is the swimming pool analogy. You know, we're getting drained out right now. Financial balances are getting drained out. And it's coming at a time when we have this, this calamity and this panic going on about the banking system. But I want to talk about the banking system. We know the drains are coming. And I've been telling you that since December. I tell you, you know, a quarter in advance. I tell you two quarters in advance. I tell you a year in advance, like exactly when these things are going to happen. And these flows are, uh, you know, they're tradable. And if you don't want to trade them, then you, you understand they're coming. It's like, you know, you're a meteorologist and you see the conditions coming together at certain times of year, you know, like summertime along the uh, equatorial, along the equator, uh, you, you get uh, hurricanes, you know? I mean, it's just like, this is, it's like science, man. It's, it is, and I, and I try to present it in that fashion. But here's the thing, when you look at uh, right now bank capital, and the Fed has a very good series on this called res bank residual residual that's essentially assets minus liabilities that's capital that's net worth that's literally your net worth if somebody says well what's your net worth well you take your assets minus your liabilities that's your wealth that's your wealth and although it has come down from from the peak in 2021 when it was like I don't know, close to 2.2 trillion in, in capital, it's now like 2.13 trillion. Okay, and if you look at a, a long-term chart, and here it is, uh, you, you hardly see any decline in that. I mean, there were some periods of decline 
you know, previously, historically, but I mean, the recent pattern, and here's a blow up of that of, of the last five years, the recent pattern has not been uh, catastrophic. It's not been catastrophic at all. So like, that's number one. Number two is the fact that with the Fed paying interest on reserves, and you have, you have about five and a half trillion in reserves right now, and the Fed is, uh, and I'm going to talk about the Fed rate possible or maybe not even a rate hike ne next week. That's a, that's a separate topic. I'm going to touch on that in a second. But I mean, right now with five and a half trillion, maybe a little bit more in reserves and the Fed paying, what, 4.75%. I mean, you're talking about like 200, what does it come to like 260 billion annually of money the Fed is just giving to the banks. I mean, that, that goes directly to their capital. You know, that's just like free money. And I know it, it, it can infuriate you and it should. We don't get that. But I mean, the Fed is just handing out free money. The government's handing out free money too as interest rates go up and I talk about this every week like we are now like well well over a hundred billion uh, in additional fiscal flow uh, or, or, or um, interest income transfers well over a hundred billion of where we were last year. So again like to me if the swimming pool is filling up and you're always going to have situations where there's going to be companies that are mismanaged. I'm not saying SVB was mismanaged. I, I did a rant the other day about how I said, you know, when the Fed starts to raise interest rates, the way the regulatory situation is structured, I mean, it, ju it just puts, it, it just requires them to have more capital. And it's a, it's a messed up system. It's, it's a really a messed up system and it would be a much better system if it would just follow the prescription of MMT, which is like, you know, you keep interest rates at zero, you manage the economy through fiscal policy, and um, you suspend this regulatory requirement uh, where... Uh, reserves are part of the calculation of leverage ratios, okay, which that's, that's where the problem is. And I mean, they suspended that during the pandemic and everything was fine. And then it was like Pocahontas, what's her name, Elizabeth Warren, like, no, we got to put that back on. And that came back on last year in 2022 in March. And then this is when the whole thing started to happen. And then actually, actually what, what happened was that <laughs> Again, the Fed had to create an entirely new facility, the reverse repo facility, so that the banks were able to shunt the uh, deposits off into that facility so as to remain in compliance with these crazy regulations. Like, who, who comes up with regulations like this where they, they literally uh, op oppose each other and it just makes for needless uh, volatility and needless uncertainty um, and needless risk to the system. But these are the, you know, these are the geniuses that we have in charge. Now, what was I going to talk about? Just so I said I was going to talk about something else. Oh, yeah, as far as uh, Fed rate increases. So now, at least early this morning, I don't know, maybe this has changed again, but if you look at where Fed fund futures were trading this morning when we were down big and this whole Credit Suisse uh, situation, which by the way, I, I think Credit Suisse is going to be fine. They're, they're going to have a backstop by the government of Switzerland, believe me. I worked for Credit Suisse when I lived in Switzerland. Maybe some of you didn't know this, but... I lived in Switzerland for 10 years. I was a, a proprietary trader. I managed money for the bank. Um, I mean, they're not, they're not going to let Credit Suisse go out of business. But, and remember, by the way, I, I also should bring up the point of Deutsche Bank. Last year, what was it, last year, uh, I forget when it was, maybe during the summer or something like that, or October, it was in October when Deutsche Bank 
you know, that was the headline every single day. Is Deutsche Bank going out of business? Are they going bankrupt? Blah, blah, blah. The stock was down. I don't know. It was on like, I think it was down at seven. It might have been lower than seven. You know, the stock is, is 50, almost 50% higher right now. Um, and the same thing with, with JP Morgan. You know, a lot of these big banks, they're going to benefit from this because they're going to acquire the assets of these smaller banks. And I think things are going to be okay because I just get, again, I go back to the keep it simple, stupid formula of like, if the fiscal flows are there, and maybe some of you are just tired of hearing me saying this, but may, I think a lot of you, maybe not a lot of you here on this channel because I see the commentary now and I think the commentary is much more educated and, and, and much more informed than what it used to be. If you go back... If you go back and if you watch my videos from like, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, forget it. There would be like 5,000 thumbs down and, and you know, 150 thumbs up. Uh, but I think people have, this is an indication to me that people are becoming more informed or at least you guys are becoming more informed. So you have these flows which again I, I tried to give you some perspective on this like in 2007 2008 when we had the great financial crash when it started I mean you know you were basically looking at 300 billion a month in um, leading spending flows okay at that time a, a, a big deficit would be considered like 250 billion after the obama stimulus in uh 2009 which basically turned everything around we went up to something like 400 billion a month in leading spending flows now we're doing like 670 almost 700 billion a month well this is these last you know february is kind of a uh, it's a big month because you have tax refunds and so is March. It's going to come down a little bit, but we're still, we're still doing like over 500 billion a month, which is, you know, that's up. It's up 20, 25% from where uh, the flow rate, the leading spending flow rate was in the financial crisis of 2009, 2008, 2009. So when I see something like this, I mean, it's just, it's hard for me to get very, very uh, bearish. Uh, I, I will say this, that the debt ceiling is potentially a problem. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the first time, if you've been watching my videos for any length of time, you know, some of you maybe even like almost in a derisive fashion call me uh, a permable you know, because, but I keep saying, like, look, if the government's spending, I me, mean, Biden's new, his new budget is like, a, what, a 6.7 or 6.8 trillion now. That, that won't get passed in its entirety, but it's going to be close to that again. I mean, the normal budgets, when you go back to George Bush, and I'm talking about George uh, W. Bush, uh, what, was it, what was he, uh, Bush 40, 40, 41 or something, for not 41, he was uh, the younger Bush, the second Bush. You know, those budgets were like four trillion annually. Now, I mean, they're like almost seven trillion. And I said, with the interest now that, um, you know, the government is going to be paying on securities, that's going up. That's going to keep going up. It's going to, I told you, it's going to go, it's going to be seven, eight, maybe close to nine trillion. I mean, it's just really hard for me. Now, inflation's a different story. That, that could be a problem, especially since, you know, these sanctions and everything. I mean, it, it really kind of messed up the global, uh, global trade. And this is a problem. I mean, it is a big problem. Like I, I talked about yesterday about uh, how, you know, it, it's the real assets that count. It, it's not, you know, electronic dial, electronic dollars on a computer spreadsheet that the Fed pushes a button or, you know, Treasury tells the Fed to credit the, this account and the Fed does it by pushing a button. I mean, 
it's the real assets and when you have a situation like we have now which is probably the most destructive I don't know in like what you can go back probably three four hundred years I mean when when the British really started to manage and put together a system of global trade and, and you know kind of ran that through its navy and stuff like that I mean it's just been something that's developing and and the real rapid development of that you know started to come in the 70s with the opening of China and stuff like that and the rapid modernization of China and again we could get we get we could all get into this discussion about exports you know we got to do exports but I talked about this exports are a cost you know it's it's no longer you know the 17th century where we're trading uh, British wool for Portuguese wine I mean we all basically make the same things you know we sell we, we make cars we we make electronics we make clothing we make toys we make uh, leisure goods you know we basically we make all the same things so the way the way to get competitive or comparative advantage when it comes to trade is either through suppressing the wages of your citizenry or manipulating the currency like what China does or some other impediment or some other um, you, you know uh, policy which favors the exports but in the end it's the workers that lose I mean because yeah you get a job and a lot of people have been you know they, they were angry at me when I said this because they said yeah but at least that Mike exports create jobs yeah they create low paying jobs so that we have an export advantage so that we're the cheaper producer I think I said yesterday on my video that the uh, uh, per capita wages in China is like 13,000 here it's like 50 something thousand plus we get the goods we got the stuff and it's the stuff that you need so anyway uh, that's my update for today I just want to throw in yeah, so I'm not, somebody asked me uh, on a comment, so you still think you ought to be buying the banks? And, and I don't know, like, if that comment w was sort of, like, genuine to find out, Mike, what's your opinion? It, to me, it, it came off more like one of these kind of, hey, gotcha questions, like, hey, you were the big guy telling us all to buy the banks, right? Look what happens now. I just, and I said, look, I've been around, you know. I I was there in the 1987 stock market crash when the market went down 22 percent. By the way, I am going to have where you have re, I have rescheduled the um, podcast, and it's going to be a video podcast with Louis Borsellino. Was the greatest. He was the biggest S and P floor trader, individual floor trader. Uh, really fascinating dude, and that's happening on Friday. And I'll let everybody know and I'm gonna put I'm gonna put the video up. We just had we got our signals crossed the other day, so we weren't able to do it. But I just want to end off with this, and it, it, it gives me like it chokes me up. It does. Because a lot of you you send me your best wishes and like you care about me and I I feel it I feel it and I'm very very appreciative and grateful for it I am love you guys that's all I want to say for today so look try not to get too worried you know they're gonna put all this scary stuff in there and look I could be wrong like it could be some kind of a systemic meltdown but but you know we've seen I mean I've seen so many of these things and they come up with a plan because they have here's the here's the odd part of it all they have a structure it's like a regulatory structure that 
creates the instability which then forces them to come up with a plan. So it's like, how about this idea? Fix the regulatory structure so you don't always have to come up with a plan every five or ten years. How about that? No? I think that would be a good idea. Anyway, that's it for now, folks. Love you all. See you tomorrow. Bye.